And of course here in Romans 11, Israel as a nation is sp spoken of by Paul. So that in verse 11 when he says, I say then have they, that is Israel, as a nation, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is common to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. And I might stop there just for a second and remind you that I, but the word fall, you'll see in those two verses, occurs three different times. But the first occurrence is a different word in, in the Greek. The, the, the first, have they stumbled that they should fall, the same word is translated fail. Uh, like in the book of Luke, he said it would be easier for heaven and earth to pass away than one tittle of the law to fail. And the idea would be like, have... have uh, have the promises that God made to Abraham. Ha have the, all of those promises that were made to the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The promise to uh, give the land to their seed and uh, to, they would possess the gate of their enemies and uh, all those things. Have those things failed? Have they, ha because of their unbelief, has, have, have, uh, have all those things failed have they, were they to never come to pass? God forbid. But rather through their fall, offense, not the same word. They offended. It's true. Yes, they, 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 they have fallen not to fail utterly, but they have fallen. They've committed an offense. And yet through that offense, salvation is coming to the Gentiles and at that time to provoke them to jealousy. And he goes on to talk about uh, verse 13. And I'm sorry, I failed to mention the diminishing in verse 12, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But in fact, read verse 12 again. It says, Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? So in those few verses, he refers to the, the fall of Israel, the diminishing of them, and the casting away of them that is in verse 15. And of course, this is a, something of a, of a process and so I guess this looks like some kind of test pattern or something up here this evening, but I wanted, to, I wanted to present some things that most of you probably were acquainted with, but maybe put them in a, uh, in a, in a different, look at them in a different way. And it's, a, a, it's been quite a while back now, but for a, a number of weeks we were talking about some things that pertain to the kingdom, the kingdom doctrine and the offer of the kingdom. And I don't think we ever really got back to where we put a, a you know, bow tie on that line of, of teaching. But there's some things here that I believe we can, we can organize them in a certain way that will bring some clarity to some things that, uh, that are in confusion in the religious world and, uh, in fact, divide the, some things up that pertain to the kingdom here in about four, we've got one, two, three, four, or maybe even five different uh, compartments or, or, or sections of, of, uh, of study, things that go together. Now, I want to go ahead and put up the, the, here on the board where he referred there to the fall of Israel. Through their fall, salvation came unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, through, throughout the book of Acts, and uh, that the, the ministry to Israel was the preaching of the resurrection. It was, uh, we've talked about the sign of Jonah. He, ta he had said before, there wasn't, this is an evil and adulterous generation. There shall no sign be given it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as uh, Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So that the preaching in the, throughout the book of Acts is pre the preaching of the resurrection to Israel. And as Israel, of course, some believe there's a remnant according to the election of grace that he talks about in that chapter. But as they are rejecting 
uh, Jesus as the Messiah, as they're rejecting the message of the resurrection of Christ, they're being diminished as a nation. As they reject that message, they're, as it were, they're, they're cut off. They're like, like branches that are cut off of that olive tree. They're being diminished in there. Uh, the diminishing of them. And then he refers to the casting away of them, which uh, the exclamation mark on that was the destruction of the temple in AD 70. Uh, as far as the Scripture is concerned, we basically come to the end of the book of Acts. And so that really it's this little section of time that pertains to the book of Acts where there is the greatest, I believe, misunderstanding uh, in, in, in the religious world. Now, but let's just take a step back just for a minute. I've got you hanging on to Exodus 12. If you look there, and in Exodus 12, We'll read from verse 3. And, and, and in every case here, there's so many, we could multiply verses, and I'm really just wanting to deal with the, the most important elements, you know, that we can, the essential things. In Exodus 19, from verse 3, he said, And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, you have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So, like we we'll just say for the moment, we're going to let this be where... Israel is brought out of Egypt, which is where they really b become a nation. Notice the promises are made to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. Then they wander uh, in, uh, as pilgrims in the land of Canaan. And yet the promises are unto them. And the, the Abraham's seed winds up in Egypt through Joseph. And uh, that they come out as a, a nation. They're exalted as a nation above the others. And so, you know, that from that time... Uh, they have the preeminence over the, the nations. In fact, that's what this line, see, represents all the way across would be the, the, the nations, which of course are uh, the, the Gentiles. And so they're exalted as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation above all the other uh, nations of the earth. And, the, and unto them, of course, the promises are made. Uh, go to Isaiah 2. Isaiah 2 and get Jeremiah 23. Isaiah 2 and Jeremiah 23. Now, in, in Isaiah 2, verse 1, it said, The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. And mountains represent kingdoms, remember. And shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to that mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and He will teach us of His ways, and we will walk in His paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And He shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks, Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. The, you see, it is the, the Israel is, has the promise of being his uh, agents, as it were. They're given the authority in the kingdom 
The, the promise is unto them and they are going to uh, be the head of the nations at, when the Lord returns. Uh, the, all of those promises that, that will be fulfilled in the future. Uh, here we find them in the Old Testament that uh, uh, all of the, the nations will come to God through them and they will be, uh, have the authority in the kingdom, the kingdom uh, uh, of God. They have that position that's given unto them. Now, in, in Jeremiah 23... He said in, in verse 5 there, Jeremiah 23, verse 5, He said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. And so as I say, we're just picking out just a couple of passages out of uh, very, very many we could. But this is that which is proclaimed through John the Baptist. This is that kingdom which is being announced. All of the, the ones that... Uh, going all the way back to the, the promises to Abraham and all of the prophecies of the, uh, from Moses on through the, all of the prophets that... This is that kingdom. This is that uh, mountain that is being presented for their reception and, the, and a king to reign in that kingdom. Uh, go now to Matthew 3. And take Luke 23. Matthew 3 and Luke 23. All right, in, uh, in Matthew 3, verse 1. He said, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. And of course, this is a good time to be reminded of the fact that uh, this preaching was not unto the nations. This was, preaching was unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, as the Lord had told the, the twelve. Don't go in the way of the Gentile. It's, it's unto, unto them because it's unto them that the promises were made. They are, they are the ones that are given the authority in this kingdom. And so what we, what we have then here, is, as I say, this is just a way of thinking about the way that the, the Scriptures are organized. I'll say that... Uh, that uh, Oh, uh, how can I do this? Uh, okay. Well, what we have, we'll have, we've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in here. And what we have is the, the kingdom, uh, we'll say, the kingdom presented. That kingdom that was promised in the Old Testament Scriptures. Uh, all the things we've been looking at there. This is what's being presented unto them in Matthew through John. As I say, it is unto Israel. The, some of the Gentiles eat of the crumbs that fall from the Master's table. I realize all those things are true. But, they, but nevertheless, the, the, the fact that the Lord had said it in the same context, it's not meet to take the children's bread and cast it unto the dogs. They are, they are not the children. The children are the Israelites. And so the kingdom is being presented unto them in here. And so that's what we have in this portion of the Scripture. So that when we get to the book of Acts, though, there's something different. Uh, and we'll, I may be getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but look at Luke 23. In Luke 23, 
Uh, he said in verse 32, Luke 23, verse 32, He said, And there were also two other malefactors led with Him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified Him and the malefactors, one on the right hand on the other, and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted His raiment and cast lots. Now, you see, that prayer is very significant in what follows, you see, because as we were saying there, what we come to when we get into the book of Acts is the preaching of the resurrection and the offer of forgiveness. The, the, the Father's answer to the prayer of the Son as He hung there. And the, so that the gospel did not change as far as the twelve were concerned. You know, the, the, the message didn't change. Repent and be baptized. The kingdom of heaven's at hand. So that kingdom is presented in here. But, and, but they rejected not only the kingdom, but the king. They denied him before Pilate. And of course, that is what the fall of Israel is all about. It's the, in fact, if you, if you do want to get technical about it, Israel cursed the seed of Abraham. According to Galatians, Christ is... Abraham's seed. He's the, he is the, the one. And so when they denied him before Pilate, they asked for Barabbas. They, uh, they denied him as their king. Uh, they said, uh, uh, let his blood be on us and on our children. I mean, gosh. Uh, and yet he said, Father, forgive them. So uh, I want you to go to 1 Corinthians 2 and get Acts chapter 1. First Corinthians two, Acts chapter one. And of course, here in First Corinthians two, we're we're jumping ahead of, of where we are in time, but this is something we need to be reminded of here at this point. And so in First Corinthians two, uh, Paul said to them in verse six, First Corinthians two, verse six, he said, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. See, up to the point we've gotten to there where He's at the cross and saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They have no idea of, of, of Him being a sacrifice in death for anyone. The, the princes of this world and the leaders of Israel. Well, even the disciples, you know, even <laughs> didn't believe the women who had seen him uh, when he was risen. The, the, and there were different times we could go to the passages and see where he told them to, for example, to, to, when he had been up on the Mount of Transfiguration. They came back and he said, don't tell anyone what you've seen until the Son of Man be risen from the dead. And it said that they questioned one another what the rising from the dead should mean. It's not that they didn't believe in resurrection, because they did. Martha believed in resurrection. They didn't understand about the resurrection from the dead. What's one of those little words? Like of and from. And the resurrection of the dead is one thing. The resurrection from the dead is an entirely different matter. They had no idea of one man rising apart from all the, all the others. That he should be the first that should rise from the dead. That's the sign of, of his Messiahship. That's the sign that he's the Son of God. Is that he's the first that rose from the dead, you see. But th none of that, that was a, a mystery to all of them. Mystery to the, the principalities in heavenly places. The, a mystery to the leaders of Israel. They had no idea that that was what God was accomplishing at that moment. And yet he had, that was ordained before the foundation of the world for our glory. Like before God ever said anything to Abraham about any promise or any kingdom whatsoever, he had already chosen us in Christ. 
before the foundation of the world. It's like that all of that was set in motion because of something that he desired where we were concerned. Um, so, you know, this, where, where we've gotten to there, the, the death of Christ for sins, no one knows about that. That's, that's a mystery yet at that point. We'll go to Acts chapter 1, and we're going to look at a few things here in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 1, and we're going to start from verse 1, the same man that wrote of him asking for forgiveness for them, Luke, Acts chapter 1 verse 1, he said, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, you've heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence." When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Now, it's very important to, know, to recognize that it's the book of Acts begins with that question, and he doesn't answer it. So that you see, uh, and it's very evident then as we follow along and look at the preaching of especially Peter and of the twelve, that they are fully expecting the kingdom to come. They have, so that what we have in the book of Acts, where the kingdom is being presented in Matthew through John, we have the kingdom... Oh, gosh. Expected. It is in expectation. In fact, it's, it, you see, it's, 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 uh, it's even strengthened from being presented. They have every reason to expect it now because of the fact that of, of His resurrection, you see. I mean, uh, and, and all of the things that are revealed in their preaching. And, uh, you know, I, I, there's so many things about l dividing these things out and looking at them. I, I, I'm really having a hard time not rushing ahead because I don't, I, I don't want to, I want, I want to get certain things established first. But, but this goes a long way to understanding the tone of the book of Acts. Because all throughout the book of Acts, the Israel has every reason to expect the kingdom to come. They are fully expecting it to come. In fact, if it had not been for the things that the Lord showed Paul and what Paul communicated unto them, they'd still be looking for it. You know, really. But... It is, it's in expectation all throughout the book of Acts. And so you'll notice things that are said come to uh, chapter 2, Acts 2. And in verse 22, after that Peter uh, is baptized with the Spirit, by the leadership of the Spirit, verse 22, Acts 2, verse 22, He said, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by Him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. In effect, Peter is preaching unto them that what happened there was according to the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't remove their guilt, but he is expressing to them that what was done was done according to the counsel of God, you see. And... Uh, and and so he goes on to say that he uh, preached the resurrection. Come over to chapter 3. And um, 
Maybe we'll read, let's read from, uh, we'll read from verse 17. Acts 3, verse 17, he says again, he said, And now, brethren, I walk through ignorance you did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all His prophets, that Christ should suffer, He hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And He shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all His holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first God, having raised up His Son Jesus, sent Him to bless you, and turning away every one of you from His iniquities. It's a little bit hard to get the real tone of that message there because I, I think all of our lives, our minds are so distorted by the way things are presented in religion. But, the, but this is the, the, the tenderness of this message here, I think, is what's hard to get, to get across. I mean, to, to consider all that they, they did in rejecting Him and their whole... No wonder He said, be converted. But what, was to, what, would, what would convert them would be the love and kindness of the message. Unto you first He sent to bless you. You that turned your back on me. You that denied me before Pilate. You that... I know that through ignorance you did this. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. You see, and, and uh, no wonder Paul quoted the, a, a, the, a passage from the prophets that I'm sorry, right now I can't remember. But in Romans 10, unto, uh, he refers to uh, uh, having stretched out his hands all day long to a disobedient and gainsaying people. In my mind, you see, I see this passage and it's like I see his, his outstretched arms. He's, he's reaching out unto them. The, the, you're the children of the prophets. You're the, he, he's sent him unto you first to turn away every one of you from your iniquities. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. You see. And that, that love and tenderness, that turn of things is, is, a, is hard to get across in, in, in this way. But, but, but so they have every... It's like a... The, the kingdom is just, a, is just there in, in full expectation for them to have. But come over to chapter 7. Acts 7. And Stephen basically sums up what their attitude was in the face of this preaching. Acts 7 and verse 51. He said, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels, and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And by the way, the, this is the statement that the Lord made when He was with the, the council of the Jews the night before His crucifixion. When He said, Hereafter you shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power. That's when they basically said, Well, you're worthy of death. We don't need any, we don't need any further witnesses. It was what set them off. And this is what, they, and so the same thing Stephen says sets them off again. 
verse 56, and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. It, 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 what it, it matches that there's a parable in Luke 19 about a, a man that had gone into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants, gave them ten pounds and said, Occupy till I come. But he said, But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And the reason I'm making that motion is because I believe that's the idea. You see, because that's where Stephen sees him. He sees him there. And, uh, 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 when in Acts chapter 1, the, uh, after those 40 days and the Lord ascended up and a cloud received him out of their sight, his position is there, I believe, throughout the book of Acts. Throughout the book of Acts, the, the Lord... See here, <laughs> the kingdom is presented and He's with them. And keep, He said uh, that the kingdom of God is within you. And people think that somehow or another that He's saying unto them that the kingdom of God is inside of every, every person, you know. No, he's, he's Himself. He said the kingdom of God's within you. I'm here with you. So the kingdom is presented and He's here with them. He rises from the dead and He ascends up to the position in the clouds and the kingdom is in expectation. Every, you know, and, and signs and wonders associated with this message, signs and wonders associated with this message. The, uh, you know, every, everything in place. No, and yet, after He said, uh, let me read verse 56 one more time. And there. It says, said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon Him with one accord and cast Him out of the city and stoned Him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And He kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And it's like, well, the Lord's not through with them yet. Father, forgive them. They know what, what they do. And Stephen says, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Well, he, and this is a turning point, you know, but he's not through with them yet. Uh, come over to chapter 26. Acts 26. And so as Paul gives his testimony, he said uh, in verse... Well, we'll start from verse 8. He said, Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death... I gave my voice against them, and I punished them oft in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me, and then was journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. And so here's the first person who ever hear to ever learn why Jesus Christ died, to receive, and of course he receives the, the, the salvation, he sees the Lord here, and of course evidently 
the, when Stephen saw the Lord standing, he st had stood from that place where, if you'll notice Peter saying in Acts chapter 2, he was raised to sit on David's throne. The writer of the book of Hebrews says that he sat on the right hand of the majesty on high and evidently was sitting. And that, you know, that's the, that's the relationship of all of the preaching in the book of Acts uh, as far as the twelve are concerned. But then, of course, the, he's brighter than the sun. And so the, Saul sees the Lord and Paul is saved during this time uh, when the kingdom is still in expectation. It's still he uh, he's not entirely through with them, and probably that that prayer of Stephen is in view of what God is going to do with Saul, because you see some of them believed through his message, even after having blasphemed. I I rather suspect he was you know a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So. Uh, he's the first to hear the, the good news. Uh, and, you know, uh, there's this Jew in Acts 13 that's a false prophet. He represents them as a nation and Paul blinded him. And it says that, you know, called, called for his blindness. And it says that that Gentile man that was with him when he saw the blindness of the Jew believed. And I believe part of the the benefit of, ha of getting a handle on some of these things is because in dealing with people, you know, the church didn't replace Israel. We're not spiritual Israel. Uh, there, there's some kind of a thing where, you know, they just did a shifting around and that, no, they're separate. Israel as a nation has, was a separate people. They fell at Calvary. They were cast away at the end of the book of Acts. God is not dealing with them today. And yet there's coming a day when they're going to be restored. And yet... The church is this mystery in the middle, you see. It's not, uh, it's not part of Israel before or after. It's a separate entity entirely. And so understanding that Israel fell, but not forever, they are going to be restored, and it's probably sooner than any of us have any idea about. Uh, that, uh, uh, you see, and it's yet we're, we're separate people. It's not the, the church is not Israel. Israel is not the church. The kingdom doctrine for Israel, different from the, king, the doctrine to the church, the body of Christ. Uh, turn a couple of pages and look at Acts, I mean, sorry, Romans. Romans chapter 1. In Romans 1, verse 13. He says, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was led hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I'm debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as envy is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So you see, because the, this ministry begins during that time when the kingdom is still in expectation, the gospel is to the Jew first. And it is for this reason also that there are signs still in the church at this time. Uh, the... Um, Speaking with tongues, uh, the healings, the, um, uh, the sign gifts of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. All the, uh, those things are so because that ki the kingdom is still in expectation. And there are two ministries that are going on side by side during this period of time in the book of Acts. It is true that the body of Christ begins. Paul is the first, you see. But it begins during this time. And yet... There came a day, we come a couple of pages backwards, go to Acts 28. And so from verse 23, Acts 28, 23, it says, And when they had appointed him a day, there came many 
to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed, after that Paul had spoken one word, Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and, sh and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, fat, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. So we, in other words, basically it's so amazing to me. It's like what we, the question that was asked in Acts chapter 1, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? Does it get answered until Acts 28? And the answer is no, you see. So that all that time that the kingdom was in expectation, now the kingdom is... Suspended. Now is that mystery that, you know, that silence there, if it weren't for Paul, there would be nothing known of the dispensation of the grace of God to you Gentiles, you see, and where there, there is no advantage to being a Jew as far as God is concerned there there are none, even though God knows. Uh, and I started to put a little dotted line across here because they are, and yet they are being preserved in the world. And I don't believe it's necessarily through any action on His part. I do believe it's according to His foreknowledge. I know you understand what I'm saying. I don't believe that God is preserving it, Israel today by any miraculous means as He would have done in time past, and yet He knows that they, are going to, they have survived and will by His foreknowledge. They are being preserved as a people. And, and as individual Jews, those that hear the gospel and reject it are lost like every other lost Gentile, and yet those that hear it and believe it have, are saved right along with the salvation, which is to you Gentiles. It's not, there's no special position that grants them a hearing any more than anyone else, you see. Uh, it, and so it is this that while the kingdom is suspended, when God is filling up the body until... We'll go back to Romans 11 one more time. I'll tell you what, while you're turning, get 2 Thessalonians 2 and we'll probably wrap it up, but I want you to get Romans 11 and get 2 Thessalonians 2. And of course, it is in Romans through Philemon, even though some of those epistles are written during the time of the book of Acts. That's so amazing how you know, that, that that is. You get to Acts 28 and then here we come into the book of Romans and the doctrine is for the time, you see. It's for the dispensation of the grace of God. And we're, w during which time the kingdom is suspended. It, it, we're not looking for it. That's why the Lord's Prayer is a, a vain prayer to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will. No, it's not going to happen in our lifetime. You know. But because some of those books were written during the book of Acts, that is why they talk about the ordinances and the things that they follow because the exactly. Jews have yet fallen away. Exactly. Exactly. You're right. There were certain practical things in there, uh, like you're talking about the ordinances and uh, and some of those practices that were, you know, still being uh, being observed, which passed away uh, at the end of the book of Acts. And so, but none of the spiritual truth. Changed, In other words, the salvation by grace through faith, the gospel didn't change, but Christ died for our sins. And yet not just the Jew first and the Greek, but to, unto all, you see. 
Yeah, uh, that's exactly right. And, and in fact, uh, you know, I believe we could probably prove, we could, we could show that Paul knew about the dispensation of the grace of God before he ever wrote a sentence of any of his epistles. He wasn't at liberty to talk about it, but he knew about it. And I believe there are certain places where, you know, if you know something that you just about, as they say, split a gut, <laughs> and it just sometimes it just leaks out. I mean, the very reason in 2 Corinthians 12, the reason he's given a thorn in the flesh is lest he should be exalted through the abundance of the revelations. It was to keep him quiet before the time. And it, and it was, it's like, see, he was bound in the Spirit and yet a free man during the book of Acts. But he lost his freedom, and, but his spirit was set free because now he could tell. He could make that known that he had that the exceeding riches of His grace, the glorious gospel of Christ, which was to include those people who were without hope and without God in the world like you and me. Uh, marvelous things there. If, just observing the, how, the, you know, the, the step by step with Paul there. Romans 11, verse 25. He said, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, their enemies for your sakes, but it's touching the election. They are beloved for the Father's sakes, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. So that there's something that has to take place. And of course, he says there, it's the fullness of the Gentiles. It's the rapture. It's when the, this body that began back there during that time. Uh, and the, you know, he talked about those who first, we who first trusted in Christ and you also trusted. Anyway, that body gets filled up and then uh, we go to meet the Lord in the air, and then at some point the preaching will be made unto Israel again as a nation. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. And of course, the Lord will return and save Israel from their enemies and all those things that we looked at that, that could have taken place here, they'll be fulfilled over here, and Israel will reign over the nations, over the Gentiles. They'll go into the kingdom for helping them through their time of trouble. But none of that can take place as long as we are in the world. We've got to, we've got to be removed before uh, the kingdom can be uh, restored. In fact, I thought about, you know, could put another little time in there. Of course, the, this kingdom is going to be presented all over again, really this gospel of the kingdom be preached again, but it's in view of their restoration, you see, uh, over there. But that can't come as long as we're in the world. And so once, we, once the rapture comes, then God will remember Israel as a people. He'll bring them up, as it were, out, of the, out from among the Gentile nations. They'll be preaching unto the, the, unto the Jews in the, uh, in the tribulation. Uh, I look at Second Thessalonians two, and I, I'm I'm, going, I'm sorry, I'm just taking up my full time here, but Second Thessalonians two, and just read here with me from verse one. Second Thessalonians two, verse one. He said, "Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto Him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us." is that the day of Christ is at hand. And you know, I believe that the sum of that thought there is that if in view of any afflictions or tribulations that you may suffer, never let anybody tell you that it's because we're in the tribulation. In other words, the day of Christ is not at hand. If we were in the tribulation, it would be. And I, I believe that's, uh, that's the, that what he's presenting to them the day of Christ is when, he, you know, the day of His glory and all over there when He comes to save Israel. Verse 3, 
Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. I believe the he there is the church. It's Christ in the church. And then verse 8, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So you see that I believe the time is just ticking on down when this day of grace is going to be over. And we that are withholding, we're, I mean, uh, you don't, you know, I mean, <laughs> you can get a sense of this in the day-to-day -day things of the world now, you know, that there's some people in the world that just aren't fooled. <laughs> and a lot of folks that want everybody to be fooled. And because you're not getting fooled, they don't like that. <laughs> well, the day's coming when everybody's going to be fooled because the ones that understand the difference will be gone. And I reckon they'll be happy about it. But... Uh, We'll meet the Lord in the air and then He can begin to finish the, all of those things, all of, the, the, all of the, the things that were spoken of by the prophets come to pass and that kingdom be restored. That <laughs> what Lord, without this time restore again the kingdom of Israel, that's when it'll be. The deliverer shall roar out of Zion, turn away ungodliness from Jacob, uh, destroy him there that, sat, that uh, sat in the holy place that said he was God. Um, and made uh, the world uh, worship Him and humanity, you know, whatever. Uh, but anyway, I, and I, as I was saying, that there, there, there are a lot of things that kind of match up when you see all of this, because even, even talking about the, the signs, you know, the kingdom is being presented, there's signs. Kings in expectation, signs. As long as it's suspended, no signs. When it's restored, signs. And yet there'll be lying signs also. Uh, here, the kingdom is presented. How many baptisms? Well, there's one. It's water. Water baptism. The kings of expectation, though, there's two. There's water and there's spirit. Kingdom suspended, only one. Spirit. But the kingdom is restored. Two again. So there are these little landmarks in there, you know, like uh, there's the, the, the crucifixion and then the resurrection and the beginning of the book of Acts, the end of the book of Acts and the destruction of the temple and then bingo, the rapture, uh, you know, and then, of course, the, the confirmation of the covenant after that. But, uh, and, here, and, of course, <laughs> finish up the... Scriptures, there's Hebrews through Revelation. So that the you know the the, the, the pattern of the of the scriptures and the, the way that they're laid out there. Um, you kind of get a get an idea about what's going on and what the Lord is doing in each place. And so you know, so if we could keep them separate, then we, a lot less confusion. Anyway, that's just a, an, an illustration or a way to kind of gather some thoughts together and uh, look at that. Um, I, I really fear that what is, was said there in Acts 28, though, is becoming true of the Gentiles. You know, their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, you know. Um, but anyway, um, 
it amazes me that that we sit around here and we're one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight people, and we hear so much truth, but we can't go to these churches out here and hear hear this truth, you know. And I hear the people that are in the churches, and my my boss, I think he's saved, but you know, every day he prays, let's do some kingdom work. I'm just like, you know, we're not in <laughs> and, oh, well, we got to do our kingdom work, you know, and mm. and it, it amazes me, and that kind of coincides with what you said, you know, how how the, you, you hear something, but you don't hear, but, you know, see something, but you don't see, mm-hmm. and mm. and we, I think we're there, you know, and, mm. and where it's dwindling down to the, and, and it's, it's sad, and uh, I try to I try to share the truth I know with people. We have a every Monday we get together and and it and it's something that's kind of I, I would like for you guys to pray for me. That that's hard for me to understand is how I can feel so comfortable talking here, but like when I'm there talking to different people and we have this little prayer group and it's five ten minutes long every Monday morning at work and there's four of us there. Well, last time I wanted to share, you know, they talk about all this stuff. I wanted to share the gospel with them. So I said, I want to show you where the gospel is in here. What, what saves you? You know, 1 Corinthians, verse 1 through 4. And uh, so I got the book and I started reading. And I noticed that when I start speaking about this stuff, I, I get very nervous. And I've never been nervous. I can get up and mm-hmm. play the guitar in front of these people. Mm-hmm. I can get up in front of 500 people and say this brilliant speech and I've never ever got nervous but Mm. when I talk about the word of God it's almost like my voice starts shaking Mm -hmm. and I I don't understand it you know does that make sense well John uh, I believe that's the kind of thing that Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 2 I I don't think we read where we read was after those verses but he starts out by saying that uh, that my speech and my preaching was not enticing with enticing words of man's. He said, "When I was I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling," and I don't think that Paul was a chicken. I don't think that he was in that that you know. I mean, I think he was a, a bold man. But the thing about it is, when we deal with the things of God, anybody that's not trembling, it doesn't need to be talking, because it is is a all. And as they say, it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. I mean, we're dealing with holy things here. That, and uh, it reminds me, I might have told you this about this, an old story about, uh, I think it is said of Dwight Moody, the, uh, who was an evangelist, you know, and then there was a woman that heard him and her son was there. Uh, we, and w- when the message was over, she brought that her boy up to, to meet him. And she said, Brother Moody, my my boy wants to be a preacher someday. Do you have anything that you'd like to say to him? And they say that what he said, well, son, if there's any way you can get out of it, don't do it. You know. And I believe that. Uh, you know, it's like, I mean, I, I still I believe in, in called people. But at the same time, we're all called, you know, to in that sense, to... That, that know the Lord to do what serve Him the best way we can. But I, I, I would say, hey, that's that's perfectly normal. I wouldn't. Yeah. And uh, and and gosh, I mean, it, uh, I, but I'm glad I know the truth. I'm glad. Amen. I, I know the truth, and, and that's powerful. Well, that is a certainly a a, a right motive, and uh, you know. Uh, as long as the the you know the the Lord is exalted, and you know, I mean, hey, it, we don't, you know, we're He's chosen the weak things to confound the things that are, uh, you know, strong. And um, but I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel bad about it. Yeah, you know, I was, <laughs> the what you were thinking about. This is a kind of subject, but or talking about earlier, you were saying. Because I always heard this verse, you know, it said, had, you know, the devil known that Christ was dying for the sins of the world, he would have never crucified him. But you said something, you said, not only did the devil not know, but the angels in heaven didn't know. No, you, you know, nobody knew. And is, is that true? Like, Well, uh, 
I don't know uh, uh, as far as it. The power of the principality. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, and it was basically referring to the uh, yes, the fallen, the fallen angels. But uh, as far as the angels of God, I, I mean, I really don't know. I, it's funny you brought that up because I was I was reading something not long ago. A person was man was presenting the that there was rejoicing because of that. I I don't know. I I don't know of of any passages that I could go to right away and and and, uh, and point that out as far as the angels. One thing that is evident for sure is that they didn't know about you and me. They didn't know and they didn't know about this. Uh, if you look at like Daniel 9 and Gabriel is sent to Daniel with a laying, laying out, you know, the, the beside the prince you know, that the certain number of weeks and then he'll be cut off but not for himself and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and then he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And so there's just this big blank in there yeah. of like 2,000 years that, that Gabriel knew, knew nothing about. And so there's no reason to believe that any of the angels knew it. Uh, in fact, uh, in, in, in Ephesians 3, but verse eleven or twelve in there, he talks about the eternal purpose. He said that, that unto the, he says that unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. It's like they are learning of it from us. Wow. So I would say no. I mean, I could be wrong about what the angels knew. Peter says that there's a lot of things they desire to look into, so they don't know everything. Um, they learn. They learn things from us, and someday we're. The, the Paul said that someday we'll judge them. I'm not sure exactly which ones he means, but he said, "Don't you know that you're going to judge angels?" You know, you mentioned about the the few, and I think about that. You know, I wonder why. You know, here it is, this big old world full of people that, you know. But uh, the Lord spent three and a half years training 12 men. You know, he preached to the multitudes, but there was a, he had a, another job that he was doing in there that didn't involve very many people. So, 